Every year, over one million people from around the world visit the Newport mansions. This video will explore how the Gilded Age came about, the lifestyles of the wealthy, and visit several popular estates. In 1850, America was unprepared for the far-reaching impact of the Second Industrial Revolution. The one-man shop became mass production factories. The shares of stocks issued in these new industries grew exponentially, and unregulated stock market trading made the top 9% of the population rich almost overnight. They had no reservations about flaunting this new wealth. Thus began the race to build bigger and more opulent mansions. There was Osgood Castle in Colorado, Villa Vizcaya in Florida, Pankhurst Mansion in New York, Hearst Castle in California, Linwood Hall in Pennsylvania, and the largest private home in America, Biltmore Estate in North Carolina. If any area exemplified the excesses of the Gilded Age, it was Newport, Rhode Island. Newport was founded in 1639. It was the most important port in Rhode Island. It was also a major hub for slave trade. This is Kingscote. It was built in the Gothic Revival style. This included steep gables and pinnacles. Other features were intricate detailing and tall windows. It was built in 1839 by George Noble Jones. He made his fortune in the slave trade and owned several cotton plantations. The ornate detailing continues inside. The rock inlay on tables is perfection. Hand-carved hardwoods were a display of wealth. At the outbreak of the Civil War, the family moved south, never to return. The end of the Civil War brought about rapid economic growth. The oil refinery industry grew, railroads expanded west, new industries such as steel manufacturing and electrical power emerged. It also began the rise of the robber baron. Congress was totally unprepared to regulate these sudden changes of industry. This massive wealth also made corruption inevitable. Today, the challenge is how to regulate artificial intelligence. In the late 1800s, the challenge was how to regulate the monopoly. The robber baron would buy up all of one industry, getting rich in the process. Cornelius Vanderbilt made his fortune in railroads. He was able to purchase every railroad from New York to St. Louis. With no competition, he had total control of wages, working conditions, and shipping costs, which led to higher consumer prices. John D. Rockefeller grew rich with Standard Oil. His company owned the oil fields, the refineries, even the gas stations. He would control 90% of the oil market. It was Mark Twain who coined the term Gilded Age. He would say, this period is just gilding. 
it is all glitter on the surface, but corrupt underneath. It was the desire to escape the dirt and congestion of New York that drew the rich to Newport. The clear skies and clean air provided the perfect location to build their summer mansions. The ocean breeze and the wonderful view from the cliffs was just what was needed to get away from the pressures of city living. The best route to Newport is over the Pell Bridge. A short distance south of the bridge is Bowen's Wharf. It was established in 1650 and was a major port during colonial America. Newport is now a major yachting center. It has hosted transatlantic races and the America's Cup competition. It is also popular for recreational boating. Numerous specialty shops have replaced the old warehouses. The area was just as trendy with Gilded Age customers. It was only a short carriage ride to their homes near Bellevue Avenue. This is the Elms. It was the home of Edward Berwick. He made his fortune in the coal industry. The conservatory would double as a sunroom. The parlor was used for receiving guests and general conversation. The ballroom was the largest room. Victorian era balls would start at 9 p.m. and last until 5 a.m. the following morning. They would include breakfast. Gilded Age ceilings were highly decorative. A formal dinner would last about two hours. The breakfast room features Asian lacquer panels. These have been sprinkled with gold. The tapestry gallery features priceless works from Renaissance and French weavers of the 1700s. The grand staircase leads to the living quarters. Windows overlooked the formal gardens. 
They are in the classical revival style. Included are terraces of marble, a park of fine specimen trees, fountains, and a sunken garden. With little work to be done, the days are filled with social activities. This is the Breakers. It was the home of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. His money was inherited. The facade is made of hand-carved Indiana limestone. The ceiling of the lower loggia is covered with thousands of mosaic tiles. When visiting any Gilded Age mansion, always look up. Just inside is the Grand Ballroom. Like most ceilings of the era, there was no lack of paintings and highly ornate gold-gilded carvings. Next to the ballroom is the dining room. The chandeliers are Baccarat crystal. The morning room is designed in the late Renaissance style. Like most interior doors, these are solid hardwood with gold or brass hardware. The music room was constructed in France. It was then shipped to the breakers and installed by French craftsmen. The walls of the library are solid Circassian walnut from Russia. It was cut in Europe and stamped with gold. The fireplace was acquired from a 16th century French chateau. At the far end of the ballroom is the grand staircase. It features a priceless 400-year-old French tapestry. Above is an 11 by 33-foot skylight dotted with rubies. Above the lower loggia, is the upper loggia. It was a great place to relax and enjoy the ocean breeze. It also offered a wonderful view of the Great Lawn. The Breakers has 70 rooms and an area of 125,000 square feet.
Conspicuous consumption was the trademark of the Gilded Age. The flaunting of wealth and aggressive one-upmanship were pervasive. Two trips each year to Europe were the norm. Women wanted the latest fashion and preferred the shops in Paris. The men would travel to London for their custom fittings. Arriving home, they would host 10 course meals that would last hours. No expense was spared for a masquerade ball. Costumes were made in Europe using authentic fabric and designs of the period. The desire to outdo each other grew more competitive over time. If Vanderbilt hosted a grand banquet, C.K. Billings would counter with a seven-course meal on horseback. If Carnegie displayed his fine art collection, Astor would build an entire wing for his. It was all about outdoing each other. It was all about having more than the other guy. Not all properties have been restored. These are the ruins of the Bells. It was built in 1876 by copper magnate Theodore Davis. Many mansions have been repurposed. This is Ochre Court. The mansion is now the main administration building of Salve Regina University. It has been restored and also hosts concerts and lectures. Our last property is Marble House. It was owned by William Vanderbilt. He gave it to his wife, Alva, as a birthday gift. Doors are solid bronze and weigh three tons. As the name implies, Marble House includes 500,000 cubic feet of imported marble. The dining room is walled with pink Algerian marble. The ceiling painting is 18th century French. The Gothic room was designed to display Alva's collection of medieval and Renaissance objects. The ceiling of the Grand Salon is a French 18th century painting. The walls are hand-carved wood with gold gilding. The draperies are silk-cut velvet. The staircase is yellow Italian marble.
Both the railing and the chandelier are gold gilded bronze. The bedrooms are on the second floor. Alva's bedroom is in the Louis XIV style. On the back lawn is the Chinese tea house. It is modeled after 12th century temples. Newport has several excellent beaches that are open to the public. A highlight not to be missed is the cliff walk. It borders the shore for three and one half miles. After almost 400 years, Newport still attracts people from around the world.